uh, uh, over the course of the coming weeks. Uh, we're looking forward to making progress. Um, there's also news out this morning uh, about a foreclosure moratorium extension. Some of you may have seen the COVID crisis has triggered a housing affordability crisis with more than 10 million homeowners behind on mortgage payments and communities of color at even greater risk of eviction and foreclosure. Today, the administration is taking another step to bring urgent action relief to the American, fam American families struggling to keep a roof over their heads. This is something the president talked about on day one. We talked about on day one. But today, the Departments of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Veterans Affairs and Agriculture announced they will extend and ex expand the foreclosure relief programs, building on the steps President Biden spoke about a couple of weeks ago. These critical protections were due to expire in March, but as part of today's announcement, the foreclosure moratorium and the mortgage forbear forbearance enrollment window will be extended through June 30th. The administration will also provide up to six months of additional mortgage payments to forbearance for borrowers who entered forbearance on or before June 30th, 2020. These actions will bring needed relief to most of the 2.7 million homeowners currently in forbearance and extend forbearance options for nearly 11 million homeowners with government-backed mortgages across the country. It's critical, it remains critical, that Congress pass the American Rescue Plan to deliver more aid to struggling homeowners. Uh, as we speak, or maybe a little earlier, um, depending on when the call wrapped, um, Jeff Science had a regular call with a number of governors, uh, our COVID response coordinator, of course, um, providing them with key updates on our pandemic response, as well as hearing from them about the work they're doing on the ground. Uh, as a part of that call, he announced that we're increasing the vaccine supply to 13.5 million doses per week uh, that will go out to states. This is a 57% increase from the amount states received when the president was inaugurated. So since then, obviously, we have announced a couple of increases over the course of time. We're also announcing that we're doubling the supply to our pharmacy program. Uh, when we announced that, we said it would uh, be uh, it would be building over time. So this and today's uh, announcement amounts to two million doses going to local pharmacies this week, and this program will expand access in neighborhoods across the uh, country so that people can call and make an appointment and get their shot conveniently and quickly. Eventually, as supply increases, more than 40,000 pharmacy locations nationwide will be providing COVID-19 vaccines through this program. This is a critical, critical uh, part of our uh, plan. Uh, last, I or sorry, second to last item. Um, Last but certainly, or second to last, but certainly not least, um, we opened healthcare.gov as planned and as we had announced uh, for a special enrollment period until May 15th to provide all Americans the opportunity to sign up for health insurance. They can go to healthcare.gov. Nearly 9 million Americans are eligible for free or subsidized health insurance. Finally, uh, as you know, uh, a brutal Arctic mass impacted the central United States this weekend bringing freezing rain, sleet, and snow from Texas to the Mid-Atlantic. On Saturday night, Texas Governor Greg Abbott requested a federal emergency declaration due to the severe weather storm. Homeland Security Advisor Dr. Liz Sherwood Randall called Governor Abbott on Sunday to let him know that the President had immediately granted his request to help meet the state's mass care and shelter needs. Yesterday, uh, Liz additionally called the other governors in the storm's path on behalf of the president, including Governor Ivey of Alabama, Governor John Bell Edwards of Louisiana, Governor Laura Kelly of Kansas, Governor Reeves of Mississippi, and Governor Kevin Stitt of Oklahoma. She expressed the president's strong commitment to ensuring that the federal government proactively does everything it can to support state and local officials in preparing for and responding to the events that impact our citizens. We will, of course, continue to monitor the storm's updates in the days ahead. With that, Steve, go ahead. First, Jen, uh, the president's schedule didn't have a whole lot of uh, official events before he leaves this afternoon. Can you give us a sense of what he's been doing today? And then uh, is, does he plan to reach out to those specific governors from those affected states, Governor Abbott and, and others who are affected by the storm? 
Uh, I expect, so let me take the second and first. Um, the President has been kept abreast, as I noted, of the events and up, been, been provided updates, regular updates, uh, on the storm and the progress and, of course, uh, the emergency declaration. Uh, I don't have any calls to read out, but I expect he will be involved personally, and if we have calls that he's making himself, we will uh, provide that information to all of you. Uh, in terms of what he's spending his day doing, uh, he's continuing to have uh, meetings with his policy teams and experts about uh, his uh, plans to bring relief to the American people and public. Uh, and um, you know he's remained uh, he's remained focused on that today uh, behind the scenes before he travels to Wisconsin for a town hall later this evening. And just on, on the vaccine announcement, uh, is there any, any discussion of, of this winter weather affecting uh, the vaccine distribution? And what steps is the federal government taking to ensure that? There's no spoilage of those vaccines, which have to be kept in those very cold temperatures during shipping and th rain delays. Uh, you're right that we monitor, obviously, weather, Mother Nature, and the weather can sometimes impact and requires contingency planning, which is something our team is quite focused on. Our COVID-19 response team is also in close touch with state and local governments across the country. We're monitoring the situation in Texas very closely. Obviously, FEMA is running point on a number of the operational pieces, uh, but while I don't have an update now, it's something we're very mindful of, and we uh, contingency plan to ensure people are getting the doses they need at an um, appropriate timeline. Well, on a different topic, uh, Congressman Penny Thompson uh, filed a civil suit against former President Trump, uh, part of what we expect to be a, a, a slew of, of civil suits against the former president and others involved in the, the January 6th insurrection. Does President Biden have any response to that, and does he support efforts like that to use the civil uh, courts to hold President Trump accountable? You know, he certainly supports uh, the rights of individuals, members of Congress and otherwise, to take steps through the judicial process, um, but I don't think we have a further comment on it than that. Uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Trevor, let me go to you. I promised. Go ahead. Um, so uh, just okay, on, um, uh, two on foreign policy for you. First, um, there was a rocket attack um, in Iraq uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, um, and uh, Iraqi officials have said that the group that took responsibility for that attack has ties to Iran. Um, my question is, one, whether you've made that determination as well, and two, what kind of retaliation would be considered? Sure. I uh, appreciate the question. We're still working through attribution uh, with our Iraqi partners to determine precise attribution for this attack. Obviously, that's a priority. I will convey that we are outraged by last night's rocket attack in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. Initial reports indicate that the attacks killed one civilian contractor and injured several members of the coalition, including one American service member and several American contractors, and we offer our condolences to the loved ones of the civilian contractor killed. The Iraqi people have certainly suffered for far too long from this kind of violence and violation of their sovereignty. I will also note, and I think the State Department provided this update, but just for all of you, Secretary Blinken has reached out to the Kurdistan regional government Prime Minister Barzani, and Secretary Austin is speaking with his counterpart to offer assistance with the investigation and to help hold accountable those responsible for, for this attack. But we have not determined attribution at this point. And do you expect that there would be retaliation if, if there, once that, that declaration is made? Well, as always, um, the President of the United States and the administration reserves the right to respond in the time and the manner of our choosing, but we'll wait for the attribution to be uh, concluded uh, first before we take any additional steps or obviously have any additional announcements. I will convey to you that obviously diplomacy is a priority uh, with this administration and uh, something that is front and center to our engagement with our uh, global partners around the world. And certainly uh, these calls uh, are evidence of that, uh, but that will always be a part of our strategy as well. And to the point of diplomacy, um, one thing that, that uh, Germany has asked for is um, some relief as far as the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, um, and I'm just curious if, if you have an update on that, um, whether Biden will consider uh, waiving um, the ability to do sanctions on companies that are that. Well, our position on Nord Stream uh, Two has been very clear and it remains unchanged. Uh, President Biden has made clear that Nord Stream 2 is a bad deal. It's a bad deal because it divides Europe, it exposes Ukraine and Central Europe to Russia and manip Russian manipulation, and because it goes against Europe's own stated energy and security goals. We're continuing to monitor activity to complete or to certify uh, the pipeline, and, and if such activity takes place, we'll make a determination of the applicability of sanctions. Importantly, sanctions are only one of uh, among many important tools to ensure energy security, and we, of course, will do this all in partnership 
uh, with our allies and partners, uh, but our position has not changed on the, on the deal. Uh, go ahead. The President is changing gears this week, obviously, looking beyond the Hill to get out and sell this plan to the American people. Is this a sign that he recognizes that he's not likely to get Republicans in Washington on board? He certainly wouldn't agree with that. Um, I would say that uh, the President's view of the package, uh, well, one, I would say first, the President has not shifting gears. He has been focused every single day, uh, even as others have not, which is understandable, on engaging with partners, stakeholders, people who agree with him, people who don't agree with him, on getting this package through. Uh, this is an opportunity, as you noted, to go out and have a conversation with uh, the people of Wisconsin, uh, people who agree with them, people who disagree with them. But if you look at the polls, they are very consistent. The vast majority of the American people like what they see in this package. Uh, and uh, that uh, should be an indication or should be noted by member of Congress as, uh, members of Congress as they consider whether they're going to vote for it or not. So is he hoping then that these visits will help build pressure on members of Congress? Uh, no, his objective is, is really to uh, make sure he is engaging directly with the people who are impacted by the pandemic, who are impacted by uh, the economic downturn, who are worried about whether they're going to get a shot, who are, don't know where, uh, where to get information, who are worried about whether they're going to be able to put food on the table. That's the focus of this trip. Um, obviously, Republicans in Congress will have to make their own choice about whether they support the final package. It's still working its way through Congress. Um, but the vast majority of the public supports it, including the vast majority of most members' constituents. So it's really a question for them. And on another topic, would the president sign legislation to create a commission to investigate uh, the January 6th attack? Well, I saw uh, an announcement, I believe it was yesterday, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, uh, by Speaker Pelosi, or some comments, I should say. It's, of course, Congress's decision to form this commission, as we've talked about a bit in here, but it's, it's certainly one the President would support. Uh, and President Biden has made clear his views on the tragic events of January 6th, including where responsibility for them lies. He backs efforts to shed additional light on the facts to ensure something like that uh, never uh, happens again. In addition to the recently announced desire to put together a commission or form a commission, uh, we'll continue to work with Congress to identify measures that the federal government can take going forward to prevent violence uh, we saw on January 6th. And as you know, uh, probably, Mary, there's a number of hearings that are upcoming in the coming weeks, and we'll be cooperative with those, of course. What would you hope to learn through a commission? Because obviously we saw a very thorough airing of, of the events last week. Uh, well, again, I don't think the, the tenets of the commission have been formed. That's up to Congress to do. Uh, we have a role to play in the federal government, of course, with ongoing investigations out of the Department of Justice, but um, he supports uh, efforts to move forward with it, the desire to have one, uh, certainly understanding and knowing how much the events on the 6th impacted uh, members uh, sitting on the Hill. Go ahead. Um, Jen, thank you. The President yourself have frequently cited what you describe as the failures or the shortcomings of the Trump administration as it relates to their response to COVID. We're now nearly a month into this administration. Does the Biden administration now own the coronavirus response? Well, certainly the President of the United States owns the, the response to the COVID pandemic. That's why he is focused on it every single day. However, it's important for the American people to know what we inherited. Uh, when the president came into office. And what he inherited was um, not enough supply, not enough vaccinators, not enough places for uh, vaccinations to happen. Um, communities had been left to fend for themselves. And so that's what he's been focused on and working on. Uh, but certainly, if he were standing here, he would say that's why it's the issue he wakes up every morning and is focused on, because addressing it is what's on the minds of the American people. And he's the president. It's his responsibility to focus on it. Let me ask you if I can. I want to bounce around a little bit back to the impeachment mm -hmm. trial that just wrapped up. You guys posted a statement late mm -hmm. on Saturday where he said the final vote, though it didn't lead to a conviction, the substance of the charge the president said is not in dispute, even those opposed to the conviction. He cited Mitch McConnell believed that Donald Trump was guilty of a disgraceful dereliction of duty, practically and morally responsible for provoking the violence unleashed on the Capitol. So if he wasn't convicted through an impeachment trial via Congress, via the Senate, how should a president who commits acts that President Biden says are not in dispute be punished? Well, I think obviously there was a process that worked its way through the Senate. That's why we put out a statement on Saturday evening. Does he support criminal prosecution? 
that that will be up to the Department of Justice to determine. We're, we're doing something new here, and there's going to be an independent Justice Department to determine what any path forward and any investigation would look like. Absent this president's actions, though, do you think, does, does something like this, does it seem, I mean, Mitch McConnell left that door open to criminal prosecution. Would actions like this, do they meet the bar for criminal prosecution? I am not going to speculate on criminal prosecution from the White House podium. Uh, we, the president is committed to having independent Justice Department that will make their own decisions about the path forward. Let me ask you a last question on the candidates. Housekeeping around here. T.J. Ducklow's, we know, is no longer working for this White House. He was suspended for a week after comments that he made to a, a female journalist. The president, as you know, on Inauguration Day said, if you're ever working with me and I hear you treat another with disrespect, talk down to someone, I promise you I will fire you on the spot. No ifs, ands, or buts. He didn't fire T.J. on the spot. He has since resigned. Has the president's position on talking down or disrespecting others changed? I think the president leads by example, and I try to do the same. And uh, on Saturday, when we announced that uh, T.J. Ducklow had resigned uh, his position, uh, something we all agreed was the right path forward, uh, I made clear that every day we're going to try to meet the standard set out by the president in treating others with dignity and respect, with civility, and with a value for others through our words and our actions. He's no longer employed here, and I think that speaks for itself. Uh, go ahead. Jen, thank you. Uh, as you prepare to put out an immigration plan mm -hmm. as soon as the end of this week, can you give us a little more information on the timing and also when it comes to the DREAMers, uh, can you give us any specifics on whether a potential pathway to citizenship will be part of the plan for that particular group? Uh, well, there certainly is part of the proposal that the President outlined uh, and proposed on day one is an earned path to citizenship, right, for uh, 11 million uh, immigrants who are undocumented immigrants who are living in the country. He's also uh, somebody who believes in the rights of the uh, DACA recipients to be in the country. He was here uh, during the of course, Obama-Biden administration, of which he played a prominent role, important role, and supported that program. Um, we've outlined the tenets of what we think the proposal should look like, which includes that, but also includes uh, funding to address the root causes, it includes investment in smart security. Uh, but Congress will have to work through what it looks like uh, moving forward, and what components will be included in here, or what components could be dealt with separately. And how important will it be to this administration that this be one overarching, large, comprehensive package versus pieces of an immigration plan that are broken up and passed separately? Well, I understand and I've read. I know there's different points of view and uh, different uh, views from uh, uh, prominent and important advocates on this particular issue, but we're going to let the bill uh, be presented formally uh, at some point soon. I'm not going to get ahead of that process, and uh, certainly the President feels that um, all of these requirements that are in the bill, these components of the bill, are what makes it comprehensive. They all need to be addressed. That's why he proposed them together. And does the President plan to rescind these Trump era restrictions on immigration and work visas that have dramatically limited immigration. They're set to expire at the end of March. Will he let those expire naturally, or will he rescind them before that? Uh, let me talk to our Department of Homeland Security. It was likely a, a conversation that would happen in coordination with them. Uh, obviously, the president president's uh, view is that um, the approach of the prior administration uh, was immoral, but also ineffective uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, the, the many challenges uh, of uh, in, uh, an outdated immigration system, uh, but I don't have an update on those particular uh, and requirements. Question on Afghanistan, has the administration decided whether to further troop withdrawals below 2,500? And if the decision hasn't been made yet, when do you expect one? I don't have any update uh, on that front uh, or a timeline of uh, when any uh, additional decisions will be made. Do you feel that the previous administration withdrawing troops so quickly tied this administration's hands? Uh, you know, I think the president is somebody who is not new to the global stage uh, and certainly not new to uh, the uh, difficult uh, decisions that meets, need to be made around uh, issues related to Afghanistan, issues related to the men and women who are serving and our own national security. So he's making decisions through that prism, but I just don't have an update on what uh, any timeline will look like. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, first, on, on the vaccine, uh, mm -hmm. you were talking earlier about how the president wants to address the concerns of everyday Americans uh, with the vaccine and the pandemic. One way the White House Chief of Staff proposed doing that last month was creating a national clearinghouse for vaccine information that would either be available online or through a hotline. Mm -hmm. Can you update us on the, on the progress uh, of, of that? Is that 
close to being bowled out? I don't have any update for you um, other than to convey that our team is always considering uh, a range of options to make information more accessible, ensure more people, more of the American public know how they can get a vaccine, when they can get a vaccine, where they can go to get a vaccine. That's part of the reason the president is, of course, traveling to Wisconsin, but I don't have any update for you on a clearinghouse or a website.